I ain't, I ain't no hurry. And we are live. Hi guys, welcome to Flat Earth British. Today in a, an unbelievable location here with Jason. Uh, we are in El Dorado. Yeah, man, we got some cool tunage going on there. Well, there's our sound check. Yeah. <laughs> Comms are in order. So we are in El Dorado in um, Santa Fe, up in the mountains, uh, 7,000 foot uh, um, in Santa Fe, in New Mexico. In Oh, if you could just, we tried to set the camera up so we could show you the mountains, the, the lower Rockies over there, but the Rio Grande here behind us, it is mind-blowing. But we got some mind-blowing golden information decoded by Jason, and he's kind enough to bring it to the Martin Lika channel to present it. So we are super grateful for that, Jason. This Thank is you, gonna, This is going to be a mind blow. We got some really juicy images. We've thought it all out for you. So present some um, images and all of the evidence uh, for Jason's case, which is really, really amazing. Okay, and there's going to be stuff said in here that is, um, you know, academia won't mention and is, you know, from Jason's, uh, you know, evidences, you know, a fact, I think. So um, that's going to be a mind blow. Okay, so it's some groundbreaking stuff going down here today. So um, let me introduce Jason Brashears, Arcade Channel. Thank you for joining us again. Oh, man, I had to travel far and long to get here. Oh. Um, for those who already know, I started a new series on my own channel about the Phoenix phenomenon, and, I'm, and I'm, it's date specific. I'm showing a whole series of videos about one single event that academia is trying to ignore and that other genres of like truth or channels and stuff are absolutely muddying the waters. And I believe it's intentionally. As a matter of fact, this presentation is about Tiwanaku in, in Bolivia, in South America, and how an ancient civilization built on sea level as a, as a shipping station suddenly ended up at 12,500 foot elevation. But more so, that's this presentation. But Martin and I, we're working on another project. And it doesn't have anything to do with ancient history. It has everything to do with truthers, hypocrisy, hidden agents, agendas. We're working on something a little bit bigger. And uh, we're just going to give you a little bit, a little, little hint of that right now. But there's a video coming out. And you know what? It's about time, man, that, you know, it's uh, things need to be called out. There are things going on that shouldn't be going on, man. It's time, it's time for people to just, you know, delete your channels, put up or shut up, debate, do something, because there's a lot of good people out there looking for good information, and they're getting blocked by gatekeepers who call themselves truthers. And I promise you, Martin and I, we're going to call them out. We're going to do it in one video, and don't care. Consequences be damned. These things need to be known by the community. What's going on behind the scenes? What's going on all throughout this truth or community? We don't give a damn about intelligence agencies. We don't give a damn about rich billionaire NGOs that are all got their hands all in the community. Screw all that. It's too late to for self-preservation. It's time to get this shit down. It's time to reveal a lot of stuff, man. And yeah, I'm just I, I'm sick of it. I'm, I'm totally sick of it. So, and I know Martin is too. I've been thinking it a long while. It's just every, everyone's thinking it, but nobody wants to say yeah, it. Everybody's thinking it. Nobody wants to say it. So, we're going to call it out. It. Let's lift the lid. But until then, we're going to have a blast. This man's got some awesome images to, awesome. to show. Awesome. And some crazy cool books. Can't wait to dig into these books as well. I see Face, di face Diaper OG. Yeah. He's in the chat. Yeah, indeed. All the guys in Sheep sham Sheep shampoo? Yeah. Oh, you gave me a blue wrench, man. I got me a wrench. Yeah, man. Thank you. Fuck that. Because Jason, right. a, a blue wrench itch? <laughs> that's a cool name. Welsh Dragon Metals? That's my son. Oh, okay. Lance, 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 Lance Lika. Yeah, that's my son. I didn't know that. Yeah, man. I might get to see him. Man, I can't imagine a, a mini mini version of you running around. Yeah, he's just like me. He's just taller. Just he's very much like me. Somebody says, Woohoo, here comes the rooster. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Yeah, man. We, listen, we've already we have already given a presentation among our friends here. We got a pretty packed house. Oh, we're traveling with a lot of people. We're going to different places and we're taking in locals. Locals in the cities that we visit, we're taking we're just in locals. Taking, we're keeping them. Yeah, with us. People, people meet, we meet people and all that. Say, hey, where are you staying? I'm staying at a hotel. No, man, pack your stuff. Come on, we're moving the house with us. We've been doing, we did that at Angel Fire. We're doing it here. 
Yeah. Well, we just we just picking up strangers. So that's yes, John. Big John. So, you know what? I'll sit behind you. It's all bad. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just realized it. So yeah, man. That's how that's how we roll. We're not trying. We're not all. Uh, we're not trying to practice exclusion. No. So before we do what we're doing here, that sound good? Yeah, man. Okay. The Phoenix Bomb phenomenon is far more do well documented than I have conveyed. I've actually, I'm actually guilty of trying to bait people in the academic community or other truth or channels. I I'm gonna let you know right now. I'm guilty of that. I've told my own listeners that I've been holding back. And that I have so I have overwhelming amount of documentation for the Phoenix phenomenon, the 138 year periodicity of this weird editing and natural disasters timeline that leads to 2040. I've been holding back on my Phoenix thesis because I've been waiting for somebody to attack me, but it's not coming. It, it hasn't come. I, I can't wait any longer. So I started my new series, The Ogaijian Deluge, because it's good that this series alone is going to be five or six videos about a single year. The year is 1687 BC in the month of May when the entire old Bronze Age world collapsed. Every single civilization in the world died. And what came out of that 25 years of darkness was basically the ancient world that academia teaches us about. The old world of Egypt and Babylon and ancient the pre-Greeks, the Achaeans, Nassos. This is the world we're familiar with. But the world that was in existence before 1687 BC was not like that. Far more sophisticated machine learning. They were using machines to build stone, gigantic stone edifices. They had the ability to move blocks that were cut, dressed, and polished in situ, and then remove them from the quarry without, without creating stress fractures in blocks that are 72 feet long and 400 tons. We can't do that today, but they did it and they did it regularly. So this is what we're talking about. We are talking about one location in the entire world. The first video in this series was on my channel and it was about Easter Island and how the same symbols in Easter Island, the same type of statuary architectural designs are found at Tiwanaku, in Bolivia, South America, they are found at Gobelki Tipi. I can't, I still can't Gobelki say that. I still can't say that word. <laughs> but they're found at that place that Graham Hancock likes to lie about. Yeah. The same symbols, Rongo Rongo, that's found on the back of the statues of Easter Island, have been found in Hittite Anatolia, right there by all the Tepe sites. Gobeki Tepe. How do you say shit? Gobeki Tepe. I'll never say it. Turkish. That place right there is only <laughs> one of 23 or 24 sites that are just like it all through. But they only focus on a couple of them because the other ones absolutely show their age. They're not that old, guys. No. We're, being, we're being deliberately lied to. Yeah, it's, and I, I go with my own videos on my channel and address this. But in this series here, 1687 BC, the phoenix appeared in the sky. It was documented. And it completely destroyed Easter Island. And now, as we're going to see, it destroyed Tiwanaku, Pumapunka, all the Andes civilizations. That's, that's 12,500 feet above sea level. But when these cities and pyramids were built, they were only three or 400 feet above sea level. And this isn't Jason and Martin telling you this. This, uh, this is the archaeologists who've been on site and found the fossilized coastlines. They have found the fossils. They have found all, all, the, all the material from that civilization spread across, just laying on the ground, fossilized in place. Hammers, chisels, human skeletons, animals, toxodonts. They don't even exist anymore. They're extinct. But they existed at this time when the city was destroyed. But the real gem of this video here, we're gonna decode the gate of the sun and we're gonna show you what the scholars have been hiding because all their interpretations of trying to figure out what the Tiwanaku calendar means on the gate of the sun, they have been unsuccessful because they've all been trying to fit a 365 day year onto the system. 
preconceptions have completely stopped academia from understanding how the ancient Peruvians counted time. We're going to show you because it's very easy. Like all truths, it's very simple. We're going to show you. It's unbelievable. Decoding the gate. It's unbelievable. And it makes sense of all the epics from ancient Sumer and Akkad that talk about when the sun gods had to pass through 12 gates. It's all it's all explained now. Yeah. Tiwanaku and Sumer, Akkad, and Babylonia are on the opposite side of the world. So it's very interesting. That's we same got, for them, though. It would have been the same for them. It would have been the same for them. Yeah, yeah. same belief, just demonstrated culturally in a different artistic way. Mm. That's really mind blowing. Yeah, man. So, oh, uh, <laughs> We don't want to give them too much about what we're doing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's walking on rice paper is is something I'm not going to do. I'm not I'm not going to. And I know Martin's not either because we've been talking for days. Uh-huh. And you know what? It's uh it's time for a lot of things in the truther community to be called out. It's it's time for individuals to be called out about who they're associated to, what's going on, money that's being money that's being traded hands. Who won't talk to who anymore because somebody behind the scene has paid them yeah. for their silence? Who people who are attacking people? That, Listen, man, this stuff's been going on for years and nobody's been calling it out. But yeah, it's far more sophisticated. This networking, trying to work against people. Y'all, I'm gonna tell you now, Martin and Jason are having it. Not only are we gonna call it out, we're gonna attack it head on. I says, truthers around here are either going to get on board with telling the truth. And do it, you know, and, and and we're not we're not trying to put perimeters on truth, we're, but we can know by spirit where a person walks. Yeah, we can judge by spirit the measure of a man's ways, the rhythm and the architecture of their personality. And we can do that by just assessing the comment section, because we're going to ask you guys the right questions, and you're going to tell us in the comment sections. And those 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 truthers and those channels and, and those haters and all that that are that you guys mentioned, those are the ones we're going to focus on. You know, we're, I'm, I'm tired of all the duplicity, and so is Martin. We're going to put people's backs against the wall. We're going to show the entire community who's about that life and who's not. Well, I mean, we're just going to expose. We're going to put light in the darkness. That's what we're going to do. About time, too. 100%. Mm. Instead of just, like, ignoring it, letting it all carry on, which is what's been going on. Yeah, man, it, it's a... It's too, it's too late in the game. It's too uh, late in the game to be afraid about anything. Too late to game. Mm. In my neck of the woods, we call it balls to the wall. Yeah. yeah I've added up to there with it all. <laughs> yeah, man. Years of it. You want to? Oh, garden goddess. Yeah. I How see you doing? Linda. They call you Marticus? Marticus, yes. Yeah, Marticus, Farticus, Esquire the third. <clears throat> it's always been my name to Mandala effect. People think I used to be called Martin. I don't recall that. Might be true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So pe- people are doing the call out thing at the moment in chat. What kind of call out thing? Somebody's got Santos Bonacci question mark. Oh yeah, yeah. We ain't starting that on this video. No, we ain't. this video's not about that. We're just letting you we're know not. what's coming. And I'm going to tell you now. We're so serious about it that we're already designing our public notices. Mm. Yeah, we're going to blast this across YouTube. Or uh, we're going to blast this across. Facebook and uh, other, we're gonna get everybody knowing what's gonna happen. You know, everybody is I'm, going I'm to all see cool it. with my enemies being on board and watching Same me because they just might get called out in the video. Give them something so, to do. Yeah, give them something to do. Nah. You're popping feed in, they're good at that. <laughs> yeah, man. It's all. It is the side of these dark powers just mincing around the community and just driving people down crazy portals of disinformation. And then some, some of them never ever come back. Some of them have worse happen. It's just, no. Yeah, no. But, but see, a lot of people in the community don't even know how some of these channels started, who funded them, how they got started, where they got their material. Or even who they are. Yeah, can't who see they, and who they used to be before they were the channel they are today. Most people don't know all this, man. Some of these people got histories, man. They used to be trolls. They used to be severe attackers against the community who then all of a sudden cleaned up their act, started putting videos out, and nobody remembers who they were oh, that's back awesome. then. There's a lot of these guys, and you know their names. Yeah, guys. Right? We, uh, we're not, not pulling no punches. So, so, that's another video. That's coming. That's coming to a neighborhood, you know, near you real quick. Funny, Otto. What do you say? Oh, it's not me to know. 
right? So Harold T. Wilkins in the 1950s published some really astonishing books. I've talked about him on my channel. One of his books is Ancient Mysteries of Old South America. Another one is uh, Hidden Mysteries of Central and South America. Both of his books are about Central and South America. Well, the man spent over 20 years going through all the traditions and the legends and all that. He never knew anything about the Phoenix phenomenon. Now, the word Phoenix doesn't appear anywhere in his, in his books. And yet still, it is his conclusion after 20 years of research and two published books that the ancient world was completely destroyed two times and by the same agency and he describes it he says that a, an unusual object appeared in the sky when it appeared in the sky all of a sudden the sun went dark sometimes the moon looked blood red red dust and red rain and red mud fell all over the world earthquakes began breaking up the continent excuse me excuse me no, it's not. It's this page is open and it wasn't before. Sorry okay. about that. There we are. Okay. Tsunamis took it. Oh, yeah, it's catching up. See the chat's catching up. Yeah. There we are. This is the book you're talking about Mysteries of Asian South America. Yeah, that's, the book is fantastic. It is a fantastic oh, book. I do You have a link for that? In the yeah, they're in the description box for most of these books. Okay, who talked about the children of the children of the sun dynasties that collapsed? Oh, uh, this man Harold T. Wilkins is a, was a genius before his time, not knowing anything of the Phoenix phenomenon. The 138 year period, I just he knew nothing, and yet he still nailed it perfectly. He described the ancient world as being destroyed in two floods caused by a celestial object, the Great Flood of Noah and a flood that happened later, which is actually better recorded. There's more historical data about it. It's called the flood of Ogyges. This is the Ogygian flood. In both floods, the entire world was destroyed. All civilizations reset back, back to square one. So Harold T. Wilkins goes into a lot of depth about this destruction happening all over the world. But when it comes to Teal Monaco, he's very specific. He says, the uh, as soon as the earthquakes began, the people were thrust into the sky. The Andes Mountains appeared in a day. They said that they were that they knew they knew of an ancient prophecy of the death of the sun, and they had disregarded it. This is what the survivors say. And when the sun died, their their uh, civilization was thrust into the sky. This is exactly what the fossil record shows. We, we've got, Pos yes. what's his name, Poznansky? Poznansky. We have the research of Poznansky, Hans Hor Horberger, and Hans Bellamy, who wrote Before the Flood. And in those books, we find out that hammers and chisels, workshops mm -hmm. open to the sky were absolutely abandoned. Where have you heard that before? Those of you on my channel, you know where you've heard that before. All the workshops, all the hammers, archaeologists found them embedded in fossilized mud. They found all their tools were just dropped and they ran for their life. Where have you heard that before? Easter Island. Hmm. The workshops of Easter Island were identical. Archaeologists were baffled that, the, that all these statues were left in the quarry unfinished. And all around the statues in the mud is fossilized hammers and chisels. Hmm. It's crazy, isn't it? Hmm. They were interrupted. They said there was an absence of tools that... Uh... Go back in tech. They, they said there was no tools whatsoever, or any evidence of any inhabitation, whatever it was. Well, that would mean that would only mean that that place was finished construction before the cataclysm happened. That's, that's what Michael also, said. it's my opinion that the Tepes mm -hmm. are from the Great Flood of Noah, not from the Ogygian Flood. They're five hundred and fifty-two years. Yeah. Apart. Okay. The, the, the two the other floods. Yes. Yeah, two different. Totally different, different floods. Yeah, yeah. And this is what Harold T. Wilkins says. Harold T. Wilkins says that Teal Wanaka was part of the second flood. And as his evidence, he cites H.S. Bellamy. Uh, you saw me reading that book yeah, this morning? Yeah, I got yeah. the book in there That's right now. H.S. Bellamy wrote a book called Before the Flood, and it's amazing. And in this book, he, he interviewed a lot of the locals in that area, and they told a fascinating story. Matter of fact, I have the story here. Oh, uh, you want to show the Before the Flood? Yeah, sure. Uh, Uh, we got all that juice there um, before the flood. That's the Peru illustration. Secrets of Asian some mysteries. I haven't got Hans that. Bellamy. You don't have that one? No, I don't think I okay, do. Okay, well, huh? Oh, 
That's all right. There's Hans Bellamy right there. Oh, that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, now okay. I can kind of. That's another book of his. Yeah, and yeah. we'll get into that. But okay. anyway, this is what he said in Before the Flood. He said that on page 72, he said that local myths recorded in the Tiwanaku region fully support these speculations. After a great flood which happened in the times of old, the country was populated again when men and women came back to the surface from caves and, and from ships in the, in the sea. This is precisely what I told you is the story of the Anunnaki, the Anuna. It's the same thing. In the book of Enoch, remember, where did the watchers come from? A mountain, high up in the mountain. They came out the underground egresses from mountain holds and they descended to the, to the valley people after, after a reset. Here's the same thing right here. Tiwanaku was destroyed in 1687 BC by the Phoenix after an older flood. That's what the tradition says. The locals say there was two floods. The second one is the, is the one for which they just never recovered. They never rebuilt that civilization. So yeah, it's really interesting that, that Hans Bellamy would uh, record that there was two floods. And the second one, 1687 BC, was about a prophecy of the of the coming of the coming dying of the sun. And Hans Bellamy wrote, it was the beginning of the age of darkness. In Peruvian, Aymara, it is what is that? Chamak Pasha? What is that? Chamak Pasha? Is that what that says? Chamak Pasha. Something like that. When the sun, when the sun was lost in the sky, of which the mythology of the Urus tells us, when they say Tiwanaku rose from the sea to dwell in the sky. That's amazing. The ancient, the ancient tribes of people who live there admit the same thing the archaeologists have found. Hmm. Seashells at 12,500 foot wow. elevation. They found fossils of marine life all around Tiwanaku. What body of water is right next to Tiwanaku? Lake Titicaca. Can you tell? Can you tell them what you know about Lake Titicaca? Well, apparently it had a giant tsunami, which is responsible for wiping out Pumapunka. That is what the official narrative is. But it's a very high elevation of water. Well, I would have to agree with that. And let me tell you why. Pumapunka. Puma Pumapunka is not like Tiwanaku. Puma Punka is nearby. And the traditions about Puma Punka is that a tsunami and a flood destroyed it, but it would have been the flood of Noah because Puma Punka was already in ruins when they started building Tiwanaku after the flood. So the tsunami is true, but when Tiwanaku was originally being built, where was it? It was at sea level. Oh, yeah, but this is so Puma Punka was destroyed by the tsunami. Then they came and built Tiwanaku right next to it. So it's, a bit, it's wrong and it's right. It's wrong and it's right. And yeah. then 552 years later, the Ogaijian earthquake shoved at 12,500 feet. This is the story that's put out by Hans wow. Bellamy. It's amazing. It fits the evidence. We have vapor canopy fossils and skeletons of, of animals that are found all around Lake Titicaca. So these died at the Great Flood. But the elevation of Lake Titicaca happened at the Ogaijian flood. Mm. If you, for those, I don't know if you have a picture of a map of Lake Titicaca. Listen, at, at Lake Titicaca, it is the only, it is the only lake in the world that has sharks, seahorses, jellyfish. Uh, oh, you know what? I did give you a black and white old map. Yeah, it's in some of the other images. Okay. And I think for the um, San so, Sanfo. Lake Titicaca was once a part of the Pacific Ocean. It was a bay. When it was just simply a bay where ships landed pre-1687 BC. Before, before. Yeah, those are beautiful pictures. Can mm -hmm. you see those? Yeah, we'll just be showing them. We can represent them. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, right. we're looking good. Yeah, those beautiful pictures. Yeah. yeah. So we're looking at we're looking at 12,500 foot elevation right here. This body of water used to be ocean. And the animals that were trapped in this body of water are all Pacific Oceanic marine life forms. But over centuries of being separated from the Pacific and in a different atmospheric pressure, they literally adapted to their environment. 
So today, Lake Titicaca is, is a freshwater lake with sharks, jellyfish, uh, marine fish, marine life. Uh, what was it? Was uh, seahorses? Mm. All that. And it, seahorses are also found fossilized all over the area. Yeah, they they say it's a fraction of its original size as well. Yeah, you know, like Chad in Africa, same sort of thing going on. It would have built all of this gap here. At some stage. Yes, so they say. Yeah, there's been ruins found in the mud all around Lake, exactly. Lake, Lake uh, Titicaca. Yeah. But it was where Puma Punka was originally located. But Puma Punka is five centuries older than Teal mm -hmm. It was totally destroyed by the Great. You want to take a look at some of that images? Yeah, let me show. Let me let me explain Puma Punka because it's not like Teal Wanako. It's it, they're side by side, and there's a reason why they built the newer place, Teal Wanako, next to the older. But Puma Punka, as I've told you guys in my presentations, the very first megalithic sites that we have around the world are technolithic. This is a term that was that was coined by James O'Conn. Technolithic means they were machined. They are they were cut, dressed, and polished to absolute perfection so well that it's very obvious that that the little niches that we find on them and the knobs and all every all these stones <laughs> were made and manufactured by machines. Yeah. This was a very ancient, technologically advanced civilization during the vapor canopy. Look at that for a lot. Yeah, look at some of these Puma Punka. You know, Puma. That, that's like, oh yeah, without machine and that. We're gonna prove. We're gonna show you pictures right now that proves that machines machines created molds. These are molds from from machine parts made out of solid rhyolite, andesite, granite. It's all right here. Yeah, yeah, man. Show them, show them something else. Yeah, these yeah this is machine. <laughs> these are machine stones. This is what Puma Punka is. It's just like a construction crew today coming in with all kinds of oh, heavy sure. equipment and using augers and routers and, and this is what they did. So what you make of these um, strange iconographies everywhere? You got the H blocks. You got these guys. Yeah, you're not looking at for those of you who don't know about Puma Punka. You're not looking at stones that were dressed and carved three, four, five hundred years ago. These aren't European. These were done 4,000 years ago, according to the best archaeological evidence. That is the only fuel that keeps the ancient aliens community going. Someone just suggested, is, could these be concrete casts? These bit casts? These are casts, yeah. This these these are machines. Yes, this, this is exactly they what they look like. This is yes. what I was telling Martin this morning that they, like, they poured metals into these. These are what you're, what you're looking at are bowls. Yes. That's what they did. That makes these, it's, sense. They're making machine parts. And we're going to prove it as soon as he goes through some more pictures. You're going to see the bowls. Good shame. That was really good. Well done. <laughs> Uh, so there's some of these blocks here and these uh, rivets. Okay, yeah. let, me, let me explain. Let me explain. Yeah, what's up? Okay, you, do you see these barbell rivets right here? Mm -hmm. This is how you earthquake proof your construction. Ah. You don't use cement and lime and all that because the convection currents will break all that and stress fractures will just make the wall weaker. You put stone side by side with these little, with these little niches right here, like that barbells, and you fill them with silver. The, sil the silver will harden inside those niches, but it will give them the strength to stay together. And when the earthquake sends the shock waves out, the silver in there will vibrate to a frequency and expand. And the expansion does two things. It absorbs the, the shock and it fills those niches and makes the wall stronger as the earthquake is vibrant. Yeah, it makes perfect this sense. Is what, this, is, this is a very popular ancient building technique in the in the in the technolithic period wow let's go there that's fantastic yeah that's so you see more examples yeah here. they poured metals into that because that's what the metals would absorb the shock and keep keep the vibrations away from the stone and they would also expand from the, the shock when it would heat them up then those metals would vibrate expand mm -hmm. and it would make that wall even harder and stronger as the earthquake increased that's amazing Oh yeah. No, it's perfect. Exactly. And that looks like a mold. It really does look like a mold. Yep. That's what that is. Oh my god. They were earthquake. They were just earthquake proof proofing their architecture. Dude. That's way back. Yep. Yeah. Again, that definitely looks like a mold. And then that's the same thing as you were talking about. This this stone here, there's two different sorts. That's like a coating. <laughs> Granity substance. Well the problem is the other stone that was here has been moved. But there ah. was a stone that was right next to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, oh, that got cut. Look at the size of that thing there, then. Yeah. 
It's and then you get these H blocks everywhere. Now, these, okay, these H blocks were used by the ancient aliens community all the time. Mm. Listen, their technolithic architecture is only evidence of high sophistication and antiquity. The problem is, is the ancient aliens community, they make the unnecessary leap that ancient technology in the old world simply means it was UFOs. It was, it was extraterrestrials. And we don't have any evidence of that. What we have is evidence of human civilizations that have been reset over and over and over. In the historical record, when we read all the, all the ancient writers like Pliny the Elder, Herodotus, Eusebius, uh, of, the, uh, of the church fathers, and especially Arnobius. When we read these authors, we read all about resets. We read all about civilizations that vanish and that the history of the world, according to Lucretius, in 51 BC, he said the entire history of the world is measured in earthquakes. Hmm. So we don't have any ancient authors talking about aliens and, and all that. It's, it's, it's advanced human civilization. Remember, I tell you guys all the time, it only takes 200 years hmm. to go from horse and buggy to hate so on collider. So, yeah, this is a, that's gate of the sun. We need to get to that last. I, I know. It's just kind of an image of uh, Puma Punko, but some of this advanced machinery. Look at this. Look at this this uh, honeycombing on the side. The honeycomb. Yeah, the honeycomb. That's a stamp. It's a stamp. That's a stamp. They poured metal over that. And, they, and I guarantee you, uh, a lot of that ended up in the in the conquistador ship holds when they melted that back down and sent it back to Spain. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because this is a shipping place. Yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. Stole all that. Yeah. Mold. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm getting the picture. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There would have been a, a big old thing. I poured metal over that whole thing. It would have been a sheet. It would have been a sheet mold of, of uh, writing. And they would have put it on a temple wall or something. Wow. And this is a big complex as well, isn't it? It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. There's, there's way more. Yeah. You can see all the. The decor and stuff. Yeah, and these stones, stones are just strewn all over the landscape by some apocalyptic event. Yeah, these these are molds. This yep. is for advanced tech, man. Maybe you could decode what they're actually building. Yeah, it's got the hole in the bottom as well. So for those who don't know, the Bolivian government has accepted from four different sources, archaeologists around the world came to Tiwanaku at different times over the last 70, 80 years. And they have done all kinds of scientific testing all over the deal. And it is conclusively, conclusively accepted by the Bolivian government that the ruins of Tiwanaku date to the 1700 BC. That is a scientific bullseye to 1687 BC. It's literally 13 years, which is a bullseye because 1700 BC, the scientific dating is only, only an approximate. Hmm. In the 1687 BC, and what we're going to see in the Ogaijian, like like we do, like we did with Easter Island, we found out Easter Island was ruined in 1700 BC as well. So if Tiwanaku was destroyed at the same time, then then what we're going, what's really going to be interesting is when I show you guys how each area of the world, archaeologists and scientists have dated that destruction, and it's always 1700 BC, which is. Which is, I mean, not all of them, not all. W.J. Perry in Children of the Sun, a 551 page book, he said that the entire world and all these civilizations were destroyed when something happened to the sun in the year 1688 BC. Mm -hmm. he, he was one year off. So anyway, it stood still. Yeah, he said he was one year off. Mm -hmm. That's a nice one there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, but this top stone don't look like the same thing as it's, it's the bottom. It's sort of, it looked like it's just been put on there. Now I know your I know your community is not real familiar, except for the ones that watch me too. They're not really familiar with my, my specialty is calendars. Hmm. It's just showing chronological systems. No, no, so no, no. Real quick, I'm gonna, my own listeners really know what I'm talking about. You guys know that the whole the whole nemesis chronology, the beginning of the Anunnaki timeline, was 5239 BC. And what's interesting is that the calendrics also show that this massive destruction happened in 1687 BC at Tiwanaku. Because on the Gate of the Sun, which is a picture he just showed you guys, on the Gate of the Sun, we have a depiction of these winged headdress wearing uh, individuals. And, and some scholars say they're angels. Some scholars say they're, they're, they're gods. If we accept them as being representations of the ancient Sumerian Anunnaki, the Anuna, then it makes sense because. So there's the. 
something to this right here yeah we're going to decode this for you toward the end of this video it's fascinating yeah. but we're looking at a depiction of divinity it's being remembered by a culture over a thousand years after these individual personalities are gone so this is in the 18th and 19th centuries bc when tiwanaku was being built it was only destroyed in 1687 bc hmm. so it's interesting to find out that the destruction of tiwanaku was 3,552 years of the Anunnaki calendar that started in 5239 BC. 3,000 years to the Great Flood plus 552 years of Phoenix cycle to 1687 BC. But 3,552 years also gives us a geomarker calendrically that's very interesting because 3,552 years is precisely 1776 plus 1776 years. And for those of you who will follow my Chronicon, major events in the Americas are always in multiples of 444 years, which is 1776 when you multiply it by four. 444 times four, 1776. American independence for the 13 colonies. Remember, 13 is an ancient American number belonging to the Olmecs and the Maya. 13, the 13th region of the world was the Americas. So we have here 1776 plus 1776 identifying a major destruction in the Americas on the Anunnaki timeline that started with 5239 BC. What confirms this is that the Olmec calendar is an American calendar. And the year 1687 BC in our calendar was the destruction of Tiwanaku. However, the Ogaiji and Deluge. However, it's also the 1687th year of the Olmec calendar. Going forward and going backward in time, two different calendrical systems, both show 1687, both show a destruction in the Americas. This is the calendrics for this day. It's very, if you saw it on a chart, it, it's even more fascinating. But we'll get to that in another presentation. Hmm. So, Tiwanaku was a whole region covered in seashells. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get back to the Gate of the Sun later. Do you have any uh, pictures of like the Kanasaya Temple? Yes, I showed them. <laughs> We yeah. are so on it. Look at the size of that thing. Uh, so. <clears throat> That's very interesting. Those heads sticking out of those blocks like that. Yeah. You, there's another place in the world where you find that. In central Mexico, there's a pyramid that's got 138. Mm -hmm. In recognition of the 138. Oh, wow, I just found them for the Phoenix number. Oh my days. It's crazy. Oh, that's the Bolivia National Archaeological Institute official dating of Tiwanaku's destruction. Look at that. 1700 BC. Yeah. It's nailed for the old guys you deluge. It's crazy. So there is crossover between uh what's interesting is, is things found at Puma Punka, right next to Tiwanaku. The exact same architectural styles have been noted by archaeologists to be a Malta. Malta in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now remember, I showed you guys Easter Island and Tiwanaku were a part of what Harold T. Wilkins calls the ancient Heliolithic Maritime Empire. It was a shipping guild. Hmm. Shipping guild. Tiwanaku, archaeologists have never really made the association to Tiwanaku being a shipping harbor. Why? Because it's 12,500 yeah, feet right. in the air. However, 100 years ago, Poznansky and H.S. Bellamy actually recorded the fossilized beach at 12,000 feet elevation, showing that Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku was right there at sea level at one time. <laughs> Excuse me. Is that what we were looking at with white sands at 7,000 or 8,000 feet? Oh, yeah. That we're, yeah, no, no doubt. White, yeah. What is it called? Uh, what, white sand? sand? White sands. No, no, no. White sands is, is missile base. That's that's All right. We were at uh, the Great Sand Dunes. Great Sand Dunes. We were yeah. At the Great Sand Dunes. Ah. And we're going back. Yeah, that was mad. We're climbing those dunes, bro. Mountain high sand dunes. Who even knew? It's crazy. So the Gate of the Sun ha has. Remember, I just associated the Gate of the Sun to the idea of the ancient Anunnaki. So 
we do have another correlate there with with the Anunnaki because the the Anunnaki is the Babylonian version of the older Sumerian Anuna. And on the gate of the sun, this figure you see right here with these big eyes like watchers, hmm. this figure right here, he has tears coming down his eyes. This is noted by archaeologists even as much as 100 years ago, and they call the god on the gate of Tiwanaku the weeping god. Hmm. What's interesting is that in Babylon, we have the same depiction of a god between two pillars, and he's crying, and they call him Tammuz. And this is why in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah actually uh, condemns four women for sitting outside of his temple and weeping for Tammuz. This is an old Babylonian. It was a type of worship. Mm -hmm. Tammuz was a god who had been destroyed in a disaster. And it was very popular in ancient Babylon for women to sit outside a temple and cry. They would make themselves cry because to them it was a type of worship in honor of Tammuz. This is, in Babylon. this is ancient Babylonian tradition, but it's also mentioned in the Old Testament. And we find it right here on the gate of the sun. Bolivia. In Bolivia, <laughs> South America. Just crazy. Yeah, oh, the same, the same effigy of the god holding between two pillars or two staffs yeah. is also reminiscent of hundreds of depictions of Gilgamesh all throughout the ancient Near East. Yeah. He was the, remember guys, he was the lord of the animals, and that's what we have on the gate of the sun. The, oh, there's been, there's like 192 small animal symbols that are found on the gate. It's really hard. You have to, you have to look at them and pen and ink illustrations because the stone didn't, doesn't really show it. But in the book I have from like 1902. I thought you would show it up. Bring it up. Do you have one? Um, yeah. I have the book which uh, shows these, you know, the yeah, because, seen, because the it, calendar that you see on the gate of the sun, those yeah. symbols, yeah, because you pull it up. Those symbols are also found uh, on the, Kalasaea Temple in, in the center in the center of uh, Tiwanaku near the Akampana Pyramid. So this is a pen and ink illustration of the detail of that stonework. Wow. You can't really see it in the stone. Wait, he's, he's crying there. She, yeah, he's, he's crying. crying. There's tears. He's crying tears right there. And what's crazy is those are leopard puma heads. Yeah. The, the tears are, are like puma heads, which is no different than the lion's heads of Gilgamesh in the ancient Near East. We have, we have a lot of crossover here. We're talking about cultures that were in contact or they had a common origin. We're going to decode. At the end of the video, we're going to decode the, the, the gate of the sun. It's going to blow your mind. It is. It's going to blow your mind. So, yeah, but look at the, these other big images out of this book. Uh, there's there's Lake Titicaca. There's yeah, a map right there. Yeah, I drew yeah. that arrow so you can see where how close Tiwanaku was to the water. Right. But ships used to come up to Tiwanaku from long distances in other parts of the world. But it's hard to believe because Tiwanaku was 12,500 feet elevation. But when you go through all the data, you realize it's been thrust up. Just like the natives said, just like archaeologists say, the whole area was thrust up in a single day when the sun died. This is their tradition. Wow. Look how many miles it is from the actual sea this side. And look at that. That's supposed to be from antiquity. That right there is tech, <laughs> that is a technolithic artifact wow. right there. Like, <laughs> like I told you guys, this is this is what a stone would look like if it was machined by something of great technological advancement. This is the stone you're looking at. We, you can't replicate that with chisels. <laughs> this is something that you see on aisle three of AutoZone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you, 3D printed yeah, somewhere, yeah. This is something you see, yeah. Here it is right here, four or 5,000 years old, just sitting in the mud at Puma Punka. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And that, that's a fact there. Yeah. So, so right here, archaeologists were baffled to find Chalky deposits of ancient seaweed with lime two yards deep, six foot deep of fossils, shells, seashells, seaweed, seaweed at 12,500 foot elevation. <laughs> man, oh man. So, so we have archaeological evidence that comports with what the natives say and comports with what archaeologists say well, of all the other artifacts they found and what these archaeologists were claiming that Tiwanaku was built as a port and nobody believed these early archaeologists because it was at 12,005 foot elevation. 
Hmm. It's crazy. So uh, Wilkins, Harold T. Wilkins, talking about Tiwanaku, he said that uh, the stones were ready to be placed, but they were unfinished, and the entire port was unfinished. It was under construction. Uh, he says the heaps of blocks of mason stones bear every evidence of having been abandoned by men who were fleeing for their lives. They were taken by surprise by a cataclysm. It's crazy. Remember, this guy wrote this book, in the, he published this book in the 1950s. And remember, he is very, very clear. The ancient world was destroyed two times and by the same mechanism. And both times, a red star appeared in the sky and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the sun went dark. The moon turned blood red. Red dust, red rain, red mud, and red rocks fell from the sky while the earth shook and earthquake. Big old chasms open, tsunamis destroyed the, the, the fleets of ships and harbors, and the Andes Mountains were thrust at thrust 12,000 feet in the air. All in a day, in one day. He describes this, and he says this is the second time that this same object had destroyed the whole world. He said the first time was so terrible, we don't have any written records about it. And he's referring to the flood of Noah. Yeah. This is... This is the 1687 BC Ogygian flood. It's different. It started a 25 year darkness where the whole world starved. It, it actually created a 300 year dark age. But it's, this is the Ogygian deluge. This is my second video on, on this year, 1687 BC. It's crazy, isn't it, man? Yeah, it's in the Colburn Bible. Yes, Colburn Bible gives a perfect yeah. description of what happened. Yeah, sure. It called it called it the doom shape. Hmm. This is an interesting uh, fact, too. You know. Oh, I got I got to say this right here because we were talking about the weeping god. Yeah. Uh, Harold T. Wilkins found another tradition in Japan about a weeping god, but in that tradition in Japan, the weeping god was crying because the goddess of Machirusa had been injured when the sun disappeared. It's a Japanese legend. <laughs> Harold, I love Harold T. Wilkins. Yeah. Yeah, he was so mystified by, by, by the ruins at Tiwanaku, he literally published in 1953 that it is apparent that the ruins of Tiwanaku are older than the Andes Mountains themselves. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they came up out of the sea. Uh, Look, fossil fish. Tropical fish have been found fossilized at 12,000 feet. Uh, so there's another area. Oh, we didn't get pictures of this one, but that's okay. Might have. There's another area uh, thousands of miles away in Colombia. It's called the Giant's Field. Oh, no. And what's really interesting about it is that the, it's at the exact same elevation as Tiwanaku, meaning it was at sea level before this disaster. But it's called the Giant's Field because mammoth bones, toxodonts, three-toed sloth, megafauna, human skeletons, artifacts, weapons, uh, hammers, everything. It's almost as if everything in that valley got flooded. And as the water went down, it deposited all the dead bodies right. together into, into a mat. And then just and, and they just dehydrated and they fossilized all together. Wow. It's called the giant's field. The entire field is a fossil. Wow. I don't believe I've seen that in, on any documentaries or anything. Yeah, I've read about it in David Hatcher Childress's books too. It's called oh. Giant's Field. It's near Bogota. All right. Colombia. Yeah. But it's at the exact same elevation as Tio Hmm. See, uh, yes, yeah, Harold T. Wilkins, man. He's a man before his time, man. What you got there? Is that the uh, palace? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, this this artifact, yeah, you know, does that remind you of anything? Yeah, hell yeah, it does. It it's Easter very Island. very similar to Easter Island. They got yeah. their hands hands in front. Uh, and they have, you the see their hands also in the back of the tepid, don't you? Yes, yep, yeah, yeah cross hell yeah. Over. Yeah, I showed a video, man. All the crossover between Gobek Gobekli Tepe and and uh, uh, Easter Island and mm -hmm. Tiwanaku. There's no way that that the, those sites in Turkey can be 10,000 BC when archaeologists say Easter Island is only 500 years old. Yeah, sure. It's so stupid. It is so stupid. You know the story, surely, of uh, Father Crespi, 
the that sounds familiar. Well, he's a priest. He lived in the um, in the jungle in South America, and the natives used to keep bringing him artifacts out of the jungle, which they found in their hidden El Dorados or the hidden, you know, civilization that they had in the jungle. And it was uh, Mesopotamian artifacts. Really? Yeah, no. yeah. I've got a book on it. It's actually um, a study. Of, you know, uh, some people theorize that's Eddie, why Colonel Fawcett know. was killed. Colonel Fawcett in the 1940s and right, yeah, 40s, right. he, he went into the Amazonian jungle and came back and said, there's full, there's stone cities and you're perfectly yeah, attacked. Yeah, yeah, he says, they're Phoenician. Yeah. When he said Phoenician, he signed his deaths. Yeah, he did. They killed, they killed Colonel Fawcett. So it's that. It's just covered in vegetation and it's just too vast and inexplicable. You can't go there. So. Oh, Colonel Fawcett. We, we may have to do a visit Maybe. on Colonel Fawcett. Yeah. Oh, the Crystal Skull? Yeah. All that stuff? Yeah. I, I don't know about his wife, though. You know, I, I had talked about, you know, the narrative. Going. I have a lot of badass pictures of the Christian skull. So if you want to do a video on it? I have. I have two. I have two. Yeah. I like a lot of those pictures. Yeah, but it's super interesting, obviously. Yeah, man. You know, if they can hold this information like the way they say, it, then it's technology. Yep. Yeah. Whatever, yeah, they're impossible to produce, reproduce in the modern day. Anyway, these these things, these glass skulls, and the old H blocks. Oh, even Colonel, I got Colonel Fawcett right here. Colonel Fawcett wrote, before he died, Colonel Fawcett wrote, the megalithic ruins of Tiwanaku were never built on the Andes at all. They, they weren't there. They, no, there was no mountain. <laughs> there was no until, Andes. Until the earthquake. Yeah, the earthquake like, shoved all that from under the Pacific. If they were under the Pacific, and Tiwanaku was an island. Shoved it all the way up to 12,000 feet. Of, dude, uh, in an crazy. instant. Created the whole South American continent. It's crazy. It's so crazy. it's not the same for the Rockies then, because the Andes are just sort of an extension, isn't they? You know, they just go, this spine of mountain goes, goes up the, the whole west of North and South America. It's, you know. Well, there's a narrow strip that connects North America and South America. You are, and yeah. it's, at central, it's at Central America. Yeah, that Panama bit. Yeah. Where the canal is. It's a narrow strip. Yeah, really narrow. Hey, well, let me read this out of, out of 1953, Harold T. Wilkins. Can I read this section? Sure. This is straight out of his book about Tiwanaku. Uh, ancient he wrote a book called uh, Ancient Mysteries of South America. He said uh, on page 173, Harold T. Wilkins said, all the signs on the ruins of Tiwanaku point to a great earthquake accompanied by a tremendous volcanism. The sea sweeping inshore in gigantic tidal waves. This is when it was still at sea level. Mm. It, it engulfed the great city. This is what washed everything away. This is why Puma Punka and Tiwanaku had the stones that are gigantic. Look, all scattered. Mm. It's because tidal waves came in and did all that. So, same thing that happened at Malta. That's why all these ruins on Malta are in the water, not on the land. Yeah. Malta, all right off the coast of Malta, are gigantic blocks that came from Hagar Keen and all uh, the Hypogeum. Yeah, they just, tsunami took all that out. Mm -hmm. so, then came a second appalling disaster which buried the smoking ruins under a great heap of muck, alluvium, mud, and sand. Everything was <laughs> reduced to chaos. Fragments of skeletons of men and animals lie lie anyhow among the broken massive stones of megalithic proportions. Bits of pottery depict prehistoric animals. Remember guys, anytime you hear prehistoric and all that, it's vapor canopy. Yeah. These are vapor canopy life forms. Megalodons. Yeah. Huge, huge reptiles, huge amphibians, and megafauna. So uh, pottery, jewels, and implements of engineering and architecture are inextricably mixed in utmost confusion. Remember, we just showed you technolithic stuff. Yeah. These people were very sophisticated. The heaps of blocks of mason stone bear every evidence of having been abandoned by men who were fleeing for their lives and taken by surprise. Also, what strikes the imagination so vividly are the coverings of extremely ancient volcanic ash and powder which overlay, overlays the ruins of the entire city. Remember, Phoenix always brings that red powder. Yeah. Always, the whole sky fills up with red dust. One image, I don't know if we have a picture of this, but there's one image, one figurine that was found at Tiwanaku. The entire figurine was made of human bones. Oh, I'm not sure. Probably don't have that one. Uh, 
maybe. No, I got a lot of data on all the fossilized fish. Millions of fossilized seashells on, on Lake Titicaca that are from the Pacific. They're not freshwater. Yeah, it's all, all this. It's so crazy. The Temple of Kalasaea is 390 feet long by 360 feet wide. It's amazing. It's gigantic. You just showed a picture of it. So like that right there? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's a vast complex. Look at the size of that. Now, you got to understand, they call it a temple, but it probably wasn't. It probably had stories, like a high-rise building. This is just the foundation. Yeah. Probably um, had, it probably had all kinds of rooms and all that. Yeah, that's crazy to think that all happens on. So, yeah. Puma Punka was a pier. It was a pier. And they're saying, and some of these researchers, remember, the ancient aliens say that those h box are were, were for landing platforms for UFOs and all kinds of imaginative imaginative BS. But archaeologists who studied those H blocks say that those are really good docking mechanisms for ships, and that they would put those H blocks on piers, and ships would come in and tie off on them. They were just decorative. So yeah, they, they kind of they kind of they kind of get out of control with that. But these ruins that you see. Hmm. This area supported a population of 100,000 to 120,000 people. Yeah, some crazy standing stones. In there. Oh, look, somebody came, somebody came to verify the age of the city and radiocarbon dating of the artifacts also supported what the Bolivians said about it's 1700, 1700 BC. 1700 BC. The reason I'm uh, the reason I'm being detail specific on the dating is because the Ogaijian flood was 1687 BC. But you've got these sensationalists without any data whatsoever who try to put the, these ruins at 11,000 BC, and they all try to comport with this younger Dryas and this fiction, this ice age fiction deal, as if icebergs were salt water, and they didn't really they don't really understand that that the entire polar regions and caps and icebergs and glaciers aren't salt water fresh they're fresh water yeah. that, that that appear every time a vapor canopy collapses and when they finally melt off and the, and the sea levels rise the vapor canopy comes back and the northern and southern extremities are no longer buried in ice and we know this because we have maps oh maps that show no antarctica ice. We have maps of the Arctic. We also have all kinds of archaeological stuff going on. What's that Arctic in the North Pole? They got that. They got that island. Hyperborium. They, I got, they got an island where they have actually excavated apple trees that still have apples hanging in the spell bath. Yeah, so I think that's it. But apple trees in the permafrost, showing that that when the vapor canopy fell, whole eighty foot tall trees were buried in snow and frozen in place. In apple trees where the apples still are were found in the Arctic Circle, frozen solid. Yeah, guys, it's the vapor canopy collapsing that creates all the ice pack, all that. Mm. So anyway, <clears throat> oh, we've exhausted our pictures. No, we got a few left. How long was we we've been going on this video? No, we had, we had a meetup yesterday. Something we talked about. Oh yeah, that was awesome. We had an awesome. Meetup. I still got to post the pictures. But we had about fifty pe people show up at the ranch house. Yeah. You know, New Mexico. They kind of got mad at us because somebody, some people went to the side of the restaurant and they were smoking some funny things. And and but you know what they Come made? They made so much money off fifty of us just showing up. It was awesome. I got to meet some people I've been knowing for years on YouTube. I had I had never been in person well as a matter of fact the whole crew here everybody's going to dinner uh i don't know if she wants to be named but, I, but she was actually a member of archaics she was subbed to my channel before i even had 300 subs and she used to support me she used to send me jars full of olives garlic olives uh, she, she used to encourage me to hey man whatever you're doing keep doing it don't get discouraged i had like 200 videos out and still didn't have 400 subs and she used to encourage me and uh tell me you know and she lived right here in new mexico and she showed up at the meetup and we're gonna go to her place her and her husband are gonna cook us some steaks we're just gonna have a blast and just we're all gonna hang out tonight at their place right here in new mexico oh, it's last night right so we're all out in the garden, you know, on the patio here last night. We're all chilling out. We're having a great night, you know, we're in and out the octave. It was brilliant. So we're watching the sky for UFOs and stuff, right? Because it's a UFO hotspot. Yeah? Yeah, man. So I look up, right, and it's what they regard the sky link. Literally, maybe, I don't know, but large white lights all connected up in like a 
you know, but just. I got some high power binoculars <sighs> right here, right here. I went, what the fuck is that? I believe it. Jason ran in to get his camera to take a photograph. By the time he came back, it just went switched off. Like it knew. Like it was like it knew we were about to record. Yeah. It was like so burnt. It was a whole string under the wow, binoculars. It was an entire string of glowing orbs. A mile long or something. It, was, oh, it had to be miles long yeah. at that altitude. Yeah. But it was weird. The moment he came out, it just went like that. And it was really bright. You know, yeah, it was crazy. massive. There's a lot of crazy stuff in the sky out here. There's people live out here, and that's what they do in their life, is they watch the sky. Because you know, it is amazing skies here, they're big yeah. skies. So I'm gonna get back to this real quick yeah, because at Tiwanaku we have another anomaly that's also comported with archaeological findings other other elsewhere in the world. And one is that there the stone slabs on which the temples and buildings of Tiwanaku were built on are 440 tons. They're massive slabs, and you just showed pictures of them. Yeah, yeah. We only have that in a few places in the ancient world. In Bell, one of them, Bell is in. I was about to say that. Yeah. One of them is Baalbek, yeah. which is interesting because Baalbek also has the same thing Easter Island and Tiwanaku have. It was also destroyed in the same year. As I'll show in another video, Baalbek was also destroyed in 1687 BC. But what's fascinating is that archaeologists have found workshops at Baalbek where they were still excavating and mining and quarrying stone, and they found the same thing. Hammers and chisels were left on the ground as if the men were fleeing from their, for their lives. And they left, just like at Easter Island, the largest stone statue, 70 foot long, is still in the quarry. It's already shaped and dressed. All they had to do was detach it because it's in situ. They had to detach it and then transport it. They never got that chance. Never got chance. Because the Ogaijin cataclysm stopped all work. In Baalbek, the same thing. They built this massive platform. They put the trilithon in place, but the fourth stone is 70 foot long, just like Easter Island. 70 foot long, sitting in the core. You've seen pictures of it. God, it's endless time. It's supposed to be the biggest megalithic. The, the biggest yeah, block in the world yeah. was still in the quarry. They hadn't quite finished it. It's like all these construction projects around the world were going off at the same time, and they all ended the same way. Yeah, man, it makes so much sense. That's exactly what's happened. So that was a. Uh, it's crazy. See right here? The quarry near Tiwanaku is evidence that the work of building was interrupted. For cut and prepared stones were just left abandoned. Very interesting. It wasn't just the same as Baalbek. Well, same just like at, at, uh, you, you probably didn't know this, but at Easter Island, yeah. many of the statues that were finished were found not at the quarry and not on the on the coast of all the other ones. They were found on an ancient road where they were being transported. They just got left right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did see something about that in the past. They said they like the natives said they walk there and they actually tried to. You know, walk a stone like with ropes because yep. there's no trees on the island to transport them. Nobody knows how they actually move them. Right. Right. No trees on Easter Island. So here's something. Here's something no we, need, we need to get to. This is this is this is uh, about the Ogaiji delusion. So, of the Aymara branch of peoples in the Andes Mountains in South America, the Urus, e U R U, the Urus are the oldest people there. Their traditions tell the story of Tiwanaku, but that's a Sumerian word. Half of the cities in the Near East were all prefixed with U R and U R U, like Ur, the Gujarat yeah. Uruk, all of them. So uh, the biblical, uh, the biblical Eric. So remember, we have crossover with ancient Babylon here in, in Tiwanaku, uh, but here we have uh, the Uru tradition of local Indians claim that. They lived in the area before Tiwanaku was built, before the time the sun was hidden. The Ooh. Phoenix, it's the Phoenix all over again, darken the sun. So, oh, uh, now this is a memory. This is when the sun was hidden. This is a memory of the vapor canopy. Dating Tiwanaku to a pre-flood antiquity, for it was the great flood when the sun was born. Remember guys, the sun was born at the Great Flood. 552 years later, the sun was killed. That's a phoenix cycle, 552 years, 1687 BC. All right, so we're, we're gonna get there. We're almost there now. Where are we at on time? I really couldn't say. Okay. We've got 818 people watching. I really I do appreciate you being here. Thanks guys for being here. Share this out if you can. Oh, we're not done. No, we're not done. So, 
the, uh, the Urus have told anthropologists that Tiwanaku was built before the time of the Great Darkness. That was 1687 BC. So I found that really interesting. And then this is, uh, look at that right there. W.J. Perry, Archaic Civilization. In his book, Children of the Sun in 1923, he said the entire world's dynasties, all of them fell. What's that date? Oh, 1688, almost, well, yeah, almost 1700. Scientific Jesus. bull die. He said about few, 1688. Few years that is fascinating. It's amazing, it's amazing. Wow. He didn't know anything about the Phoenix, didn't know anything about none of that. So here's Colonel Fossil oh, disappeared. Uh, oh yeah, many people, many people associate Tiwanaku to giants because who else is gonna be able to build, build blocks as big and move them? So, I mean, it's just, so let's say some over 200 tons, 36 foot long blocks. The average block is like 30, well, 30 foot. The bigger ones are 36 foot. But uh, in the book, Tiwanaku, you showed Peru, Incidents of Travel and Exploration yep. in the Land of the Incas by Squire. He wrote that in no part of the world have I seen stones cut with such mathematical precision and admirable skill as in Peru. And in no part of Peru are there any to surpass those which are scattered over the plains of Tiwanaku. That's amazing. Hmm. All right, so we, we've been through all this material, man. Mm. But now we need to decode that gate, don't we? Yeah, man. We need to show them the gate of the sun. Indeed. Come on in. Okay. So I'm going to get that book. Hans, yeah. Hans Billings book. Okay. Okay, okay. Just give us a second, guys. Just bring up this gate of the sun. And the epic book. So there we go. All right, that's the gate of the sun. So before we actually show that, can I can you show the camera on me so I can show them these? Yeah, sure. Hang on a minute. I can really see you on that. Oh no, just take that off. So just what you, what you mean? Sorry. Yeah. There we go. What you mean? Take the camera off. Put it on us. Huh? Like you've been to it. So they can see us. Oh, no, no. Oh, you mean you switch that off? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, they can see us right here, huh? I'm yeah, sorry. they can. I have two foot two. Oh, two. I, didn't, I didn't notice that. Yeah, right. I did that. You I did that. Know? I'm tech retorted. Okay. All right. So, 1974 74 book, Secret of the Ages. Brinsley Le Pure Trench. In this book, and in this book called Lost Worlds by Robert, Robert Charot, in this book here, yeah, it's here. But mainly in H.S. Bellamy's book from over a hundred years ago called Built Before the Flood, The Problem of Tiwanaku Ruins hmm. in these books. That's also 17,000 years ago in that book. Yeah. Uh, 17,000 BC. See, here's the problem. When archaeologists and scholars were, were researching the gate of the sun and they saw how precise it was, they they the locals told them that that was a calendar. And that's what they found. When they looked at it, there was a calendar, it was a calendrical symbol. They can, they can see the equinoxes and the solstices. It, it was made to interface with the symbols that are on the temple of Kalasaya, Kalasaya, how you pronounce it. Hmm. But what's really interesting is that in all three of these books and in many other books, scholars were baffled as to how the Tiwanakans could factor time because they could not find any evidence of a 365-day year. So they went by different animal symbols and they determined well, maybe the year was something else. So they looked at lunar cycles and they looked at, at, at months and nothing. By no species of analysis could they find any correlates with, our, with the way things move in the world today. That's the problem. Scientists were using modern frames of reference and trying to impose that on an ancient system. Remember, guys, I told you this is the danger. This is why when hundreds of books were published about the Mayan long count, going to end the world in 2012, Jason's publishing a book called Anunnaki Homeworld, where I corrected the math on the Mayan long count, and we went by the arithmetic that was understood by the Maya and not the 365 days that they didn't know about 
When you go with Mayan mathematics, you find out that it was a sexagesimal system based off units of 20 and 60. And we find out that the Mayan long count was 1,872,000 days, divided by the ancient American number of 13. That's 144,000 days of Bacton. This was a Mayan epic. It was precisely 400 years of 360 days each. That's the whole Mayan long count. Mm -hmm. And when you factor it that way, you don't get 2012 as an end date. You get 2046 as an end date. So all I did was look at the, the, the gate of the sun, which is a calendar, and according to all these scholars that wrote about or wrote about this 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 the Tiwanakans, all they could conclude was that Tiwanakos two two facts. One of them is their calendar is based off of the sun, and two, their their year is equally divided in twelve parts. Simple as that. It was that simple. Mm. And then taking those two facts. Scientists, academia tried to impose the 360 day calendar. They tried to imp impose the Venus almanacs, the movements of Venus, the eclipse calendars, the lunar, the lunar calendar. Nothing worked with the Tiwanaku calendar because they're using modern frames of reference. But if we go by the old world calendar, the calendar that was in effect for the Maya, the, Ol the Olmec, the calendar that I showed that was in effect for ancient Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, the pre-flood vapor canopy calendar. If you go by the old world's calendar, the gate of the sun right here is easily understood because on the left are 15 winged angels looking at the weeping God. 15 angels looking at the weeping God. On the other side of the calendar are 15 more angels looking at the, at, the, at the weeping God. The weeping God is holding two pillars. These are the ancient pillars of heaven. He's making sure that the cosmological clock is turning the way it's supposed to. You are looking at a gate in an ancient cosmology the cycle of the world passed through 12 gates. It's real simple. This is why Inanna in the Sumerian epics, when she went to the underworld before she could see the sun again, she had to pass through 12 gates. So 15 and 15, 30. 15 and 15 is 30. Each one of these deities represents a guardian right. of the day. That's a month. Mm. 15 days on the left, 15 days on the right. And they're all looking at the one God who's holding up the cosmos, the great celestial clock. Bingo. This right here is a single month. Every symbol here represents one day of the month. But the calendar is based off 12 divisions of the year. What is, what is 30 days times 12? Hmm. 365. 360 days. Oh, 360, yeah. Just like all the all other the ancient civilization. It's that simple. Jesus. It's that simple. It has to be. And that's Ceremonies. the same for all of them then. Yeah, it's all, every ancient civilization had 360 days for their calendar. And oh. this is why none of these people can figure this out. They're trying to use a 365-day calendar when it's staring them in the face. We have all these Babylonian, Babylonian links in the ancient Babylonian calendar, I didn't make this up, you can verify this easily. The ancient Babylonian calendar was 360 days. Here it is right here. If you pass through 12 gates, you get a year, 360 days. This is why in the Sumerian text, when the Anunnaki went to the underworld, in order to get to the underworld, the and in order to get back from the underworld, they had to pass through 12 gates. It's all calendars, every bit of it. Yes. Awesome. It was a lot more buried in the past, I noticed, than it is in a modern day. Have you seen that? It's up to here now, right, in the modern day, the ground level. Oh, yeah. Well, they've excavated a lot of that. Well, no shit. That was laid, that was laid down. Practically yeah, buried. Yeah. Whoa, that's badass. Yeah. That's a good find, man. Yeah. That's, that's That might be Poznansky there, huh? He was, he was like a Russian dude or something. Yeah, he's European. Yeah, he's not Mexican. 
he's just in the local garb. Yeah. Look at his golf right there on the left. Yeah, that's a groovy picture. Like, but no one's been there since then. This is the first people to be there. Well, it's in 12, no, nobody lives up there. It's no. 12,000 foot this elevation. Exactly. Who's going to live up there? That's why those elevation. ruins are so perfectly preserved. Yeah. But that really, that's that's our presentation. We have the archaeological, anthropological, we have the traditional evidence that all says 1687 BC was the was the year of destruction. We have the connections with Easter Island, we have the connections with ancient the, the ancient Near East. Everything, everything's lining up that the Heliolithic Maritime Empire all died in 1687 BC, and it was a phoenix destruction. Even Harold T. Wilkins comports with this, and he didn't know anything about the phoenix. Even W.J. Perry said it was 1688 BC in his epic 550-page book called Children of the Sun, where he said that every dynasty in the entire world collapsed at that time. And he, too, did not know anything about the phoenix at all. 1687 BC was when Tiwanaku ended, and the Gate of the Sun proves that they were on the old 360-day day. Deal. That's our presentation. That's our we did it. Wow, Jay, uh, I just kind of gobsmacked. That is so fucking good. It's amazing. I got goose pimples, bro. Look at that. Goose pimples. I got goose pimples. <laughs> That's good shit. Fuck. Keep doing this. That's good shit. <laughs> I left a comment on Paul Cook's video this morning. Oh yeah, uh, Paul Cook's in Egypt, and he's at the no, he's, he's in Egypt now. He's at the Temple of Karnak, just watching wow. the filming. So I just, I just left a comment saying, "Hey man, it's good stuff." Man. Yeah, he's, he goes to Malta. He, he um, done the star photo in Malta in Valletta. It's an amazing star photo. Star Look. for we gotta get, we gotta tell the news. Yeah. So um, when is that? Next week we're going in. Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday when we leave here, um, we're going to be going up to Northern Carol uh, Colorado. Because uh, the friends of Jason's, we're going to hook up their guys and basically going to take us to a staff or nobody knows anything about it. It's private, to it's private, private property. Huh? Uh, I've already seen it. I've already seen a photograph of megalithic cut dressed blocks in a wall. And he said, he's going to treat it, treat us to a meal and he's going to take us out on private property. And he said, hey, man, you're more than welcome to film all this, man. But most people never even know this exists. They didn't even know this place exists. Yes. Oh, that's going to be absolutely epic. I can't wait to do that. Take some filmage. So everyone said outstanding. Yeah, it is. Just outstanding work. So thank you all for being here. I'm absolutely gobsmacked by that, guys. We just done some amazing. We got some, you know, just make sure to come back to uh, Jason's channel in a day or so when we're going to do um, the, the obligatory necessary uh, house cleaning. Yeah, man, it's house cleaning time. It's house cleaning time. It's got to be done. Uh, you know, nobody else seems to be doing it. So I think that, you know, we should definitely. No, well, uh, yeah. well, actually, actually, all we're gonna do is reverse the polarity. Well, that's it. We have we have NGOs or someone behind the scenes that's trying to guide narratives and trying to cut off cut off voices and all that. We're gonna flip it on them. Yeah, that's, that's it. There. That's it. Exactly that. Yeah, not a connect to the energy. Just fucking flip it. Yeah, it's gonna work. So we all done here, Jason. I was absolutely thanks. Thanks everybody. I see you all have an awesome time. Eight hundred and fifty-two of you watching. So that's not free bad. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, I was in the Paul Cook video. I was watching this morning. I was just, yeah. I was just, while I was waiting for y'all to wake up and all that. I was just, uh, it was really interesting, man. That you can see the modern cement. Yeah, it, they, they re, I mean, they rebuilt Cornet. You well, I, I did a poster and showing the old photographs, and you can get this like Google website that takes your camera around it, and you can just see their massive columns. And you just got like all modern yeah. cement. It's just it's Hollywood. They yeah. did it with all of this in these Egypt, Egyptian sites. Memphis, they did the same. They just these were absolute ruins when they found them, and the rest is just modern day put together Disneyland with a fake narrative to go with it. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're going to a, an old friend of mine who's been supporting my channel since before I had 300 subs. Yeah. And uh, she she's uh, she has several books published, and uh, she's also on YouTube. But she has been she's been uh, really encouragement to me in my in my earlier days when I was frustrated. Yeah. When I had like 300 videos and didn't even have a thousand subs, I had people. She was one of them. I had some other people that were reaching out to me and said, "Hey, man, do not stop what you're doing." You're gonna, it's gonna catch, and, and, and they were right. They were looking at me now. I mean, yeah, man, they were right. Is, yeah, they're right. Boy. So, um, just uh, word up next month is this big meetup that we're having, guys, in Southern California. So, Carl, you can find that link in the description box below this video. Myself, Jason, Max Egan of Crow House, 
Okay. Autodidactic. Autodidactic. Campbell's in chat right now, guys. Logan of Decode Your Reality. And Danny. From Dan, Danny of Removing the Shackles and the Unfuckers group. And we got one other person. Toltec. Toltec Shaman. It's going to be literally biblical, guys. So, yeah, I'm buzzing, absolutely thinking about it. And if, <laughs> if yesterday's meeting is anything to go by. We were not expecting 50 people to show up at this little bitty restaurant up. in New Mexico. Yeah. Well, it was awesome. And I know a lot of people have flooded Facebook with all the pictures they took. I literally stood for with about 30 different people took pictures. Yeah, I never had a chance to see pictures. It was just, uh, you know, everyone knew me as well. I was like, well, oh, it was just fantastic. First one. Remember that, that old lady come up to me and said, Jason, I just want to, I want to shake your hand because I'm scared of Martin. <laughs> <laughs> she was scared of Marty. I had a couple of shakers, man. Yeah. <laughs> Good shit. It was awesome. So yeah, what a fantastic time. So, so cold. Yeah, that's next month. So, yeah, we're going to be live um, in, in a little while on Jason's channel. Couple I'll, days. Couple, couple of days. days. I'll keep you all basically updated on my community tab. Make sure to keep an eye on that. Any information, it will all be in the community tab. Right. You won't miss anything that we do. We will share along the way, and we'll take film, do shorts, and you won't miss anything. You haven't missed anything. Everywhere we be, you be with us. Okay, guys. Right. So you don't miss a trick. So it's good. 29 of you share this out with like it if you did like this video spread the word okay jason and martin are going to be doing a bit of house cleaning around the internet so brace your fucking selves interwebs interweb oi 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 seven oi <laughs> thanks guys you're awesome much love <laughs> fuck